Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to your Sword and Globe of Honour application webinar. Um, I'm Elaine Green, Head of Membership Events and Awards at the British State Council. For your webinar today, we're, we have a running time of one hour. Please do put your questions in the chat. Um, we'll also record this webinar and we'll provide a recording to all attendees. So if you want to watch later, that's, that's OK also. Um, should you have any further questions after today's webinar, please contact awards at birdsafe.org. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Sean Davis, who is the Chief Adjudicator for this award scheme. So now I'm going to hand you over to Sean. Davis. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Morning, everybody. Uh, I am really, really pleased to be able to um, uh, kind of give you a bit of insight into this programme and into the uh, into the scheme. I think, um, as, as many of you know, this is the kind of pinnacle award. This really is uh, something quite special and uh, we think at the British Safety Council that it's really important um, that we give applicants the, the support that they need on this and so the, the idea of the webinar is to kind of give you some hints, some tips, to give you a bit of insight, to share with you some of the experience that I have uh, had as Chief Adjudicator. I've been associated with the, the British Safety Council now for a number of years, both across uh, the ISA International Safety Award, across the Sword of Honour, Globe of Honour, and also across a number of other programmes, initiatives and, and examination schemes. And um, I'll give you some of my insights into, into what that's like and what the process is uh, of being Chief Adjudicator, because I think it's really important that we reinforce to you the, the rigour that sits behind it. What I'll be doing as we go through, I'm going to give you a little bit on the process and then going to give you a little bit of an insight into the marking scheme and questions. And then I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of insight into the Chief Adjudicator's report and how, how uh, I think that could uh, help you. As Elaine said, if you've got any questions, if you put them in the chat, Elaine is going to monitor that as I'm speaking. I'm very happy to take questions as we go or at the end. If they come up and they're relevant um, as we're going through, then, then Elaine will just interject and we'll answer those questions there and then. Okay, so she said it's a running time of an hour. If it takes an hour, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's equally fine. You will, at the end of the webinar, be receiving um, a copy of the, um, the questions, the marking scheme and the Chief Adjudicator's report from last year. So you'll have a kind of package of of support materials there as well and, and when we close Elaine will give you a reminder on where we are on the time scale and, um, uh, and, and the process for applications etc. So just a little bit on the on the governance and on the rigour. So as I said before I am the, the Chief Adjudicator so that means that I have been independently vetted and uh, trained by the British Safety Council in terms of the, the programme um, I, as I said, I've got a long-standing association with the British Safety Council, but I am entirely independent. And I can actually tell you there's been a number of times when we've been doing both the ISA, the SWORD and the GLOBE, when that independence has been incredibly helpful in terms of challenging approaches. And the British Safety Council are very, very open to continuous improvement, to challenge and to maintaining the independent adjudicator. So that should give you some real reassurance that uh, that we uh, that, that you your interests are being protected um i'm sure i'll know some if not all of you i am a safety health and well-being um professional myself having i working worked in the, i currently work in that profession and i have done for the past 25 years um so i uh, prior to my association with British Safety Council i would have been and have been an applicant for these awards so i've also been through that process myself in terms of the, set of, the, of the governance piece, we have a really strong process where we set the questions against the set criteria. And when setting the questions, we're looking at, and, and we being the examining team and, and myself, who set the questions, looking at emerging issues that face our, our profession and that are facing um, um, the kind of global safety, health, and wellbeing world. And the questions then are often. Um, often fall into two areas. There's the, the kind of discipline specific areas, which might look at things like 
emergency procedures, evacuation, risk management. And then there's often the what's often referred to as the softer element of leadership, management, uh, continuous improvement. And we deliberately look, and I deliberately look right across that spectrum when I'm setting the questions to make sure that we are giving a really good and rounded opportunity for people to, to talk about the organisations that they're in. As you know, with this being the five star audit, you're already uh, best in class organisations having met the five star uh, benchmark to be able to apply for um, a sword or a globe of honour. So we're then looking for how you are industry leading um, in, in terms of the contributions that you're making to the, the profession. We set and I set the, the marking, uh, the questions and the associated marking scheme, which I'll take you through in a minute. Um, and then we have a, a nice conversation with the with Elaine and with the team at the British Safety Council to fine tune that. We then write up the the, uh, the question set, the marking scheme, and we then look at uh, launching the programme. We've got also got other independent adjudicators that do marking alongside me. And we don't just let the independent adjudicators loose. The independent adjudicators go through, again, again a very robust selection process. We then have what we call uh, a, 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 an awarding meeting, so a standardisation meeting before the awarding meeting. And that's when the um, uh, markers, they get um, a set of papers, they get the same papers, and they mark the papers and come to this, uh, this standardisation meeting with me and they tell me how they've interpreted the questions, how they've interpreted the marking scheme, and what marks they've given to particular questions. Um, then we look at, I then look at what marks they've given and check that they're within an acceptable range. Obviously, you will get some that are slightly higher, some that are slightly lower. Where we have extremes, so for example, if I, as a, the adjudicator, mark something at a, a 12, and we've got a 7 and a 15, then I will work and we'll work as a collective group as to why why somebody would have given such a different range of marks and standardise them against uh, me as the, the, uh, the chief adjudicator. So they've got the marking scheme, they've got the standardisation process, they get cleared for marking by, uh, by me, um, and then I remain on standby and on support for them as they're going through the marking process should there be any difficult questions or comments that they um that, that come back that they i'll support them when we get to the end and the schemes closed we then have an awarding meeting where we look at the applicants uh, the applications we'll look at the scores and i'll look at the distribution of marks um, and from that i'll then also sample a number of other papers that i've not marked to look at both bottom top end and and those in the middle and I use that for them when I'm writing up my chief adjudicator's report. I then write up the chief adjudicator's report, and my particular style is I talk about applicants that have done exceptionally well, right through to those that could have done better and might have tripped themselves up on things. And I deliberately write that chief adjudicator's report so that future applicants can then consider um, my my findings and build out on that for a best practice point of view so tip number one i would give you all is please if you haven't already done so either wait until you get the email from elaine which will have the chief adjudicator report attached or get it from the british safety council website and read it because that report will give you an insight into what me as the chief adjudicator and what the other adjudicators are looking for and how we want to see and how we would recommend questions are structured and i'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute as well so in terms of that then we, we finish the process obviously as you would expect then we top and tail that and we sign that off that gets presented to um uh, elaine and the team will present that to the executive at uh uh, Richie Safety Council for, for discussion and they'll talk about what the findings are. There's also, from, on occasion, there are appeals, uh, appeals to the marks and they come in. Uh, they then come through to, um, for me, to me to look at and if there are appeals that are against something I've marked, they would go to another adjudicator. So, um, again, there's a full, um, there's a full um, robust governance process in place for that. 
Okay, so that's the actual process. And I, and I know that's kind of taken 10 minutes of the webinar, but I think it's really helpful for you to know that this is certainly not a pay your money, get your award program. There's a lot of governance, a lot of scrutiny, a lot of um, pride goes into this, for, both from the British Safety Council and from you as as applicants. And I think it's helpful for you to know that it does have such um, rigour around that. So I'll just pause there for a minute just to check in with Elaine if there are any questions before I then go on to the to the next section. Sure, no, not at the moment. You can carry on. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, so I'm now going to share my screen with you and I'm going to show you um, the marking scheme. So hopefully you can all see that um, the question set and the marking scheme. Yep. If Elaine could just give me the nod that you can see that. Yep, all good. Okay, so you can see there that uh, we have the full marking scheme all all available. You'll be shared this with you at the um, after the webinar, and um, and I think it's particularly supportive in the way that it sets out the criteria, how you can get the marks, uh, the the word count, etc., and what we're actually looking for. So the first bit is the kind of rules of the rules of the game, if you like. Um, particularly, I would really, really, really emphasise that this is linked to your audit, to your Globe of Honour, uh, to your five-star audit, sorry. So whether you're doing the Globe of Honour or the Sword of Honour, please make sure that you're making the appropriate reference. And I'll just cover that in a minute. So here, if you look then, I'm not going to go through all the questions. I'm going to just take you through one question because the principles are the same. So question one with relevant reference to the outcomes from your recent five-star audit. All of the questions have got that as a as an opening. So that immediately tells you that the adjudication marketing team are looking for this to be linked back to your audit. So we're looking for how you have taken the audit, how you've been able to interpret that and how you're going to answer this question with reference to your audit. Um, and that might seem like a basic statement, but as you'll see in the Chief Adjudicator's report, there are a number of times on a number of questions where I mention that reference hasn't been made, either a very, very cursory mention or um, no mention at all. And this is, this is a big, big um, opportunity for you to be able to score uh, some marks by linking it back. If you then look at the question, explain how the organisation has established suitable processes for the effective control of planned permanent and temporary changes that have the potential to impact upon organisational health and safety performance. So for that question, if I was doing this and when I used to do this, I'd go through the question with a highlighter pen and I would deconstruct the question and it's exactly the same principles that you would do if you were doing an exam. You read the question, you understand the question, and then you uh, answer the question. So the first thing here is explain. So it's not looking for bullet points, it's looking for an, an explanation. So some narrative, some explaining statement that answers that question. So explain how the organisation has established, and by established, how did they identify, put in place, roll out, coach, train, etc suitable how have you determined su what suitability is processes for planned and temporary changes so then in there you would be talking then about you know your planned preventative maintenance work or your planned uh, planned work for um, uh, change of patterns or shifts or whatever and temporary changes so say for example you're working in a, an operational plant and you have to turn off one particular conveyor or one particular piece of machinery temporarily for some maintenance repair or movement how how did you identify that and how did you consider what the potential to impact upon that organization health and safety performance was so as you can see in that in that couple of sentences there there's quite a lot and the challenge is for you to put that into 750 words but if i was deconstructing the question the first bit is it must link back to your audit. It must have an explanation of 
um, how you identified the suitable processes to both for two aspects, planned and temporary, and make some reference to how that has been considered in the context of affecting health and safety performance. And if you then look across the mark scheme, again, you can see that if you look at if you look at uh, what we're going to be looking for, a full explanation um, so gives gives a real rich picture. And then below that, some methodology. So what methodology did you use? How did you? And, it, and we're not always talking about really sophisticated methodology. It could be something as simple as reviewing risk assessments or reviewing evacuation plans or um, uh, some some um, impact analysis. And it doesn't have to be a, a full on explanation of the methodology, it just has to give you an insight into that, the methodology that was used and show how in considering that bigger picture, you thought about um, the various aspects of that operation and what tools, techniques, methods you use to make sure that you were considering it in the round. And then it just goes down the scale then, an adequate explanation and a basic explanation. So if, if, um, if you want to be scoring in the top, top end, then you really need to be thinking about um, deconstructing it, about giving the full rich picture piece and about giving reference to methodology. And I would do exactly the same on the marking scheme as I would do on the um, uh, with the question. Read it and then uh, deconstruct the various aspects of it. Now, my, me and my kind of adjudication colleagues, we've been doing this long enough now to know when um, a question's been answered a day or two before um, the uh, deadline, because it just becomes a bit of a brain dump of, um, of, of, of activity and actions rather than thinking about the strategy and the tactics. So another thing I would consider is think about giving yourself enough time to be able to do this and be able to do this application well, and, and write bits and go back to it. So again, when I used to do it, I'd, I, if I'd got, you know, if I knew the deadline was in a month's time, I'd start it and I might do a little bit in week one, a little bit in week two and build it up. Because when I went back to it in week two or week three, I, I found that I could refine it and fine tune it because it's a challenge to get it in 750 words, but it also more importantly, it's a challenge to get it in and meet all that criteria and giving yourself a bit of, um, a bit of kind of headspace to do that is helpful. The other thing I used to do was um, I would give it to somebody to proofread for me or to, uh, to just, before I submitted it, I would give it for them and ask them to read it through and check it made sense for them. Sometimes people from inside my function, the safety team, sometimes people from outside the function, um, just to see if it all makes sense. So that's, uh, that would be another tip. So again, the, the, the takeaways for this are, Always make reference to your audit, deconstruct the question and answer the parts, and ensure that it reflects the, the marketing scheme to give you that more complete um, answer. Sorry, Sean, we have a question. Are we allowed to submit images with the answers as well? Um, we have had images and diagrams submitted in the past. Um, I'm not sure if the new platforms got the opportunity, got the got the uh, the uh, ability, sorry, to to upload um, images and um, photos, etc. If it has, then then great. Yeah, picture paints a thousand words, as they say. But you you've got to give the adjudicator some narrative to be able to understand it. Okay, great. Also, Sean, um, just a few people are having difficulty hearing your voice. If you could just come a little closer to the speaker, that would be great. Yeah, sure thing. No problem. Okay, so any other questions on the marking scheme? No? Good. Okay. So let me now, if I can just then, um, if I can just quickly open up the, um, the Chief Adjudicator's report next. And if you can tell me when you can see that. Yeah, we can see that, Sean. Okay, 
So you should all, I'm hoping you're all familiar with this. This is the chief adjudicator's report for the sword of honor, not the globe of honor. And this is said we'll be sent out afterwards, but also um, it is available on the website. So if you look, the first right, the third write-up is the number of submissions we received and what the, the, the past standard and the past rate was. And those of you that have been involved with this for a long, long time will know that we used to have a maximum number awarded each year. We don't have that criteria anymore. So there is no quota. If the applicant meets the criteria, then you will be all awarded a sword of honour. I then write out what my kind of general findings are uh, against the, uh, the, the, the marking scheme. And again, remind people that it's really important to look at the chief adjudicator's um, report. Um, as I've said, both last year and the year before, my, my view was that this report wasn't being used because um, that's not fair, it wasn't being used in all but the best applications. I could tell where people had used it and where people hadn't used it. And so I, I'm, it's a plea really to do, to really give yourself a, a really good kind of starting point. I really, really would recommend that you use it. Um, if you look then here about um, uh, my point that I made about making reference to the, the five star audit um, and being uh, really, really clear on any kind of um, reference points that you're making and any methodologies that you're making. I then go on and talk about what it's like to be the adjudicator and the marker and how the strongest applicants and strongest applications um, give, you know, give the, the um, adjudicator a picture of, of what that organisation is and they, it helps us to help you. Um, so that giving giving that explanation, description, picture, insight is really helpful because it means that we can then um, we understand the points that you're making a little bit more. When it's not as well constructed, we can't really always follow the uh, follow the the uh, the question and the answer through. One point that I've mentioned now, and I've probably mentioned this for the last kind of four or five reports is about health and safety. This is a health and safety um, uh, award. And health, as we know in recent years, be that occupational health or broader community health has come to the fore much, much more than ever. And yet there's, it's a really big differentiator between the, um, the strongest scoring applicants and those not doing not so well. With the strongest scoring ones talking both about health and safety and the lower scoring ones only talking about safety and missing any reference to health altogether so please make sure that you are referencing both health and safety and if you think or oh, there isn't a particular point you want to make on safety then you can call that out and you can actually say there are little to no health considerations in this particular area and so i'm emphasizing my i'm, I'm, I'm focusing the question around safety. So let the let the adjudicator know that you have um, identified that. So then, as I said here, the main, the main business activities, I mentioned this earlier on, marks aren't awarded for this, but if you can give us a bit of, a bit of insight into who the, uh, what the organisation is, who, you know, what, what number of employees, the shift patterns, et cetera, et cetera, then it really helps. Um, and some, some applicants, basically said we are xyz and we do installations of abc and gave you nothing at all about where you were you know when you were working as a kind of principal contractor whether you were a supplier whether you're working around the clock whether it was under the roof anything so you need to give the 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 adjudicators an insight into the business so that we can then look at the question and your answers and give you kind of the appropriate credit for that um, um, for the answer. So if we look at this again, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go down the whole um, every question, but we'll do. We'll just do one question again. Um, so this was last year's report. So with relevant reference to the outcomes from your recent five star audit. So there it is again, making reference to the audit. Explain how senior or top management ensures health and safety factors 
are fully integrated into the overall business strategy and processes. So this again is looking to give applicants the opportunity to build out on you know, the safety is good business philosophy to emphasize that say health and safety is integrated into the decision making in the organization to show that it's a, an intrinsic part, not a bolt on to perhaps talk about kind of the culture of, of, a, of a safety first culture in that organization. I then go on and I talk about um, it's commonly accepted that participation, communication, engagement, and collaboration are important aspects. Um, what I'm looking for here is, as I said, that I want people to talk about it being intrinsic and part of the decision making and operation of that organisation, not a bolt on. It's about how senior management um, are really making, you know, big inroads, strides to support the safety, health and wellbeing culture. And things like um, uh, walk, just, just talking about a walk around once a year or um, a letter to home. Whilst they've got some credit, some credit, it's not enough to show that it's top management support. So what I'm looking for in this is to talk about, for example, when you're putting a business case in for a new way of working or new equipment or a new new premises, that safety is one of, and health is one of the concurrences to that and that um, the decision making that the, the you know, thing, things like that when you go through a financial cost cutting process that safety isn't the first one to kind of have have it have its budget slashed um, and a definition of what we mean by top management um, so making reference to you know the senior management chairman MD chief exec main board and how they're playing an active role in this then um, I said the high scoring applicants demonstrated an understanding of the of safety and business working hand in hand. And again, supported it with a full explanation where they were talking across the range of measures that we would be looking for. So financial, operational, human, etc. And that it, it's a, um, uh, a, real, a real physical, tangible commitment, not just a poster on the wall or a, or a, a kind of an annual tour somewhere. As I said, the highest scoring applicants provided examples of, of how health and safety objectives were linked into things like HR annual objectives, they were linked into things like business cases, were linked into uh, bonus and uh, uh, or other recognition payments. Um, then the weaker applicants just failed to make a reference to um, the objectives to safety being a part of the DNA of that organisation um, and to the, the, the as I called it, the symbiotic relationship uh, between the organisation, its people and the, the broader stakeholder base. So, as you can see, there's a, as I'm hoping you can see, there's a flow through then right from how the questions are set in terms of wanting to look at both hard and soft measures, process, culture, right through safety uh, uh, and uh, the health and safety and wellbeing dimensions, and including all those aspects of governance, management, leadership, standards, procedures, etc. And that all flows through right from the initial setting of the questions through the developing of the of the marking scheme, right through the application process to then into the report. And then I the missing piece for us then that we don't see is how you then use this within your respective organisations. And I, I I think it's incredibly important that you use the those of you that achieve the sword of honour that you use it to get leverage for the things that you then want to be doing on safety going forward. It, it's more than a, an award scheme and it's more than a, a, a um, certificate on the wall or a, or a sword on the wall. It's something to be incredibly proud of. It's something to be, be really vocal about. But it's also something to use to further your um, uh, health, safety and wellbeing and broader responsible business um, credentials I would say and I, and I think those of you that aren't doing that you really really should and I think 
be that using it in bids or tenders or using it to have celebration events in your organization but also looping back looping back to your operational leaders and your top management in your organizations to tell them that you've achieved this and that collectively you, know, you might put the applications in as the as the safety health and well-being teams but it's actually recognition of the work that you've done right across the piece and really really emphasizing again that safety and, and business linkage okay elaine so that's that's the the kind of taught aspect of it if you like in terms of uh, the the process the governance the mark scheme and the report now i'd just like to open it up if there's any particular questions comments this 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 is this, you know there's nothing off the table in terms of um you know attendees wanting to ask questions be that on the process on how to tackle a question uh, we we're at your disposal for um for, for what you might need Shona, just a couple of initial things. Um, quite a few questions about the types of attachments that you can attach to the submission. We'll confirm the document files later on today, but you can attach PDFs and Word files. I'll just check on Excel and um, JPEGs. For the word count, uh, we have a 750 word count. In terms of additional documents and attachments, how does that affect the 750 word count? Um, couple of things on documents just as a reminder i'm sure you're all i'm sure you're all very compliant and considerate of privacy but please don't upload documents that might have identifiable names addresses payroll numbers etc to that i mean we need to maintain that data privacy piece also if you're talking about a health issue yeah then please don't be uploading occupational health records or or identifiable information so really really challenge yourself in terms of if you're appending something, what the implications of that would be. In terms then of the word count, um, the word count, the 750 words and the application itself is what we would mark you against. If you put supplementary information in to give a bit more colour, um, we, will, we would look at that, but you wouldn't be marked on that. So you couldn't, for example, put a 750 word application into your application and then give us a 1500 2000 word um addendum in pdf it has to fit in the 750 words but if for example you were talking about um say for example the the the, the points i made about safety being on a business case if you were to say say we have a safety concurrence process where any new investment has to be signed off by the safety leads or the safety team and here is Appendix three of the business case document, and it's an attachment showing that. Then that that's the sort of thing I'm meaning, or an aerial plan, or a, a site evacuation plan, if it was an example of that. But you will be marked on the 750 words and the supplementary information. Um, if that helps us to understand your points better, then do that. So we have another question about the actual audit report um, that our clients receive. We include the audit number within all of our correspondence. So there's an easy reference number for all clients. But how does it work in terms of referencing the audit report within the answers? And do they need to include the number within the actual answer? Uh, no, because we get a copy of the audit report um with the we get a copy of your audit report to use alongside your application um so when it says with relevant reference to it's it's showing us that you have seen that read across so if you scored say for example you scored particularly high in one area or low in another you would then say you know referencing you know 1.4 uh, in our report, the the uh, auditor commented on X, Y, and Z, and um, factoring that into your answer. It's only as cursory as that. It doesn't have to be. It just has to show us that you've seen that read across, rather than the direct lift and shift. And as I said, we, we get to see the audit reports as well. Okay, we have another question. Um, somebody would like a completed sample question um so a question and answer sample i don't think we provide one of those that it's really the the could, yeah. yeah 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 and 
is the FSA FSE scores become the criteria for assessment? How are the scores linked to assessment? Say that again, sorry. How are the FSA SF FSE scores linked to the criteria and the, the assessment? So I would imagine the scores for the audit, how are they linked to the assessment for the Sword and Globe a Globe of Honor application? In terms of how we get the, the marks linked to it? Yeah. Um, the, in terms of how do the two things come together? Is that what the question is? I mean, so, so the criteria for the criteria for entering to be eligible means you have to be a five star business and yeah. then there are, you have to, as I saw, as you saw on the marketing scheme, then you have to meet the minimum threshold to achieve a sort of honour or a global honour and there's no minimum standard of that set. No uh, maximum, maximum number of those awarded set, sorry. Okay. Um, that's the end of our questions for the moment. Anybody has any other questions, please do pop them in the chat. So a uh, question on the maximum word limit of 740. If 750. we submit uh, 750, sorry. If we submit 730 or 740, is that a problem? No, no, not at all. I mean, um, there is a, there is a, although I've not, I, I can't prove it scientifically. I've not, I've not, but there is a, there's a definite correlation between um, uh, using your full word count and coming out uh, coming out with a better result, put it that way. Some of them, some of the applicants put in, might use 300, 400 words. Um, and you can't, there's a reason why it's 750 to be able to kind of get that point across. But yeah, I mean, no, you're not penalised. And, and and also, you're not penalised if you go over. I mean, we, we, we kind of, you know, we're not, we're not looking to get it up to 1500. But if, if you can't fit in what you, you know, what, what you need to say at 750 and it comes out at eight, 800, 850. I mean, I've never, um, we, we never, we, we never penalise people for it. Okay, great. And um, one question about the application submission date. So just to confirm for everybody, the submission date is the 14th of September. Honestly, if, my, if I gave you one big tip now to a takeaway, it would be Chief Adjudicator's report, read through, deconstruct the question. That's it. Honestly, it really is that simple in terms of in terms of setting yourself up to succeed. And then it's just how you you write it up. Because the other thing is as well, I mean, I probably didn't cover this at the beginning. We actually want you to do well. We really, I mean, the, the starting point for all of us, whether we're BSC or independent is we really want you to do well and we want you to build on that success of being a, a five star business. So so that's why that's why we that's why we we provide the chief adjudicator's report with a level of detail in it and things like this webinar because we really want you to do the best you, you can. So we've had a question about the use of um acronyms. Does this help to reduce the word count? Is that allowed? It does help reduce the word count. It depends on what you're using. I mean, as a profession, we love our acronyms, don't we? We know that anyway. Um, if it's a particular industry specific one or an unusual one, it's always helpful. But if it's the standard, if it's TRIFA, LTA, FR, HSE, EHO, you can take it that we know what you're talking about. If it's a, if it was a particular one or a, or a business specific one, to you that your organization uses that we might not know then um then it'd be handy to to let us know but again with acronyms i mean if you did your question you 750 words and you do three or four acronyms and then at the end you put in just for clarity these mean x y and z we wouldn't we're not going to mark you down on going over the, the word count just in terms of referring to the recent five star audit reports. What is the time period for those audit reports? Just to clarify that it is the last 12 months. You yeah. can't use an old report. No, it's the last one, yeah. Your last report, yeah. 
You and can make reference to your, you can make reference to your last report. I mean, to an older report, sorry. I mean, if you wanted to, for example, you might want to say, um, if there was with relevant with reference to the last report, you talk about senior leadership, for example, and you say we've done X, Y, and Z. You might not say, and we built out on the because previously on the previous five star audit, we didn't score that well, and we took active action to improve that, and we've gone up from this to that. I mean, that that you can do that. Okay, I've had a question about when the results are available. The results will be available from the 13th of October. Um, I think some more questions about the work plan, but I think we've covered those. And is there a specific format for the application? All applications are submitted by our learning zone. So if you haven't already received your license to um, receive a login for the learning zone so you'll receive that via the awards team here at british safety council um if you haven't received the email but you would like to receive a license for for your application just email awards at britsafe.org and we'll just reconfirm those license details but it's an online application process yeah and yeah on that actually as well it's not a it's not a sit down, you've got to do it all in a one and you can, that, that's my point earlier on, you can go back to it. And can we use references to the examples um, from our BSC audit result? Yes. You can. And I don't have any more questions at the moment. One of the just one of the tip um, when I used to do them do these going back years ago I I I used to do them in Word so I did them in I did them in Word um, first because it would a I could spell check it b I could use the, the word count piece as well and also um, if I was then you know on an unstable um, uh, Wi-Fi or internet kind of platform. If if it went down, I'd always got I'd always got one in the background. I'd always got that to refer back to. So and you know once or twice I did it on different schemes, different programs. And if and if your laptop crashes or the or the internet goes down, it can be a bit frustrating. That's yeah, and just to reassure everybody, once they have their learning zone login, they can log in as many times as they like and navigate through the questions. It's not a case of where you have to log in once, complete all of the answers and submit. You can come back to it at a later date. Yeah. And we have another question about the closing date. The closing date is the 14th of September for all applications. Anything else? Anything else in the chat? Not at the moment. Any closing comments from you then, Elaine? Uh, just to say that we will send out an email with all of the documents, the marketing, the, the marking scheme, the questions, the chief adjudicator's report. We're linked to the key dates as well, so you will know when, when everything is happening, when results will come out, appeals dates, all of those details. We'll send you contact details so you, if you have any questions about the submission dates, criteria, deadlines, all of those. If you've lost your audit um, number, you can get in touch with us. We can provide you with your audit number. Um, and essentially just to wish everybody good luck with their application. And um, please do get in touch if you have any questions at all. At all. We're very happy to help. Definitely. Yeah, good luck everybody. Okay, thanks so much for attending today and have a good rest of day. Bye all, Bye. thank you very much. Bye-bye.